It's just a simple black painted door on a cobbled street in the middle of Liverpool. But behind it, a steep spiral of steps leads down into the most famous club in the world. This week, we're taking you into the cavern on Matthew Street, where the Beatles played almost 300 times. I'm Laura Davis. And I'm Ellen Kerwin. And this is Beatles City Podcast. So, Ellen, you were in the cavern recently, weren't you, for a really special occasion? Yes, I was. I was there for Paul McCartney's secret gig. And that day was just a bit of a whirlwind for all of us, I think, especially here in the office. Um, We had to let all our readers know what was going on. Of course, he, um, he announced that the secret gig was taking place and that all the tickets were free but that everybody had to rush to the Echo Arena to pick up the tickets. But of course, you know, people had got tipped off earlier and were waiting outside the cavern. And then there was like hundreds of people outside the cavern that then had to run all the way over to the Echo Arena. And I had to do that with them because we were running a live blog. So, you know, I was speaking to everyone there and I was really going through it with them. You got the guy, didn't you, whose friends had all got tickets and he I had did. It. Oh, bless him. Yeah. So they, they traveled down um, from like five o'clock in the morning or something. I think everybody sort of had an idea that something was going to happen. Um, and he was waiting at the cavern and he just wasn't as quick as his mates and they ran off in front of him and they managed to get tickets and he didn't. And they were actually a tribute band as well. So I think he was Paul in the tribute band <laughs> and he didn't get a ticket. Oh, but um, yeah, he, he still went along for the ride anyway and waited outside. So what was it like seeing McCartney in that venue? I mean, he's only played it, this is the second time since he played there with the Beatles. It was incredible. He just, I, what I couldn't get over was, is how long the set went on for and he just didn't stop. He didn't leave the stage once. It was incredible. It really was. It's something that um, John Keats, who's one of the Cavern directors who we speak to in this episode, he was talking about how they'd had a certain set length agreed and McCartney just kept going kept he did going. he wouldn't stop I think it was I think it I think it was three songs over and he said well I'm already three songs over so I might as well make it another one and then he went for one more but he just didn't stop I think it was almost two and a half hours he was on the stage for and you could just tell he was loving it as much as the audience were and he was having banter with them as well it was really hot it was in, in the summer and we were all sweltering in there as much as called of course, Paul was as well on stage. And someone shouted, you know, get the rounds in, Paul. And he said, you cheeky thing. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was really good. I think it's really amazing that the Beatles played there about 300 times. You can really feel that atmosphere when you go down there. You can see why they would wanted to have played that venue. So tell me about what we can expect from this episode. So I met up with John Keats, who's one of the directors of The Cavern, which does still exist today. You know, there's lots of tourists that go and visit and and just people who like to listen to live music. So we met him on Matthew Street and he gave us a bit of a tour of the street and then took us down the steps into The Cavern and told us a lot about the history and also what makes The Cavern so relevant today. And Ellen, I think you'll find this really interesting. We then brought John into the studio where he told us in a bit more detail about that Paul McCartney gig. John, we're standing outside of the Cavern Club on Matthew Street. Can you talk us through what it would have been like at the heyday and also today? Of course, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very different Matthew Street now. If you look at the, the pictures, because where we are now, where the Cavern is obviously in the basement, but above here were all the old fruit warehouses. So it was, it was very... And you, can, you see the pictures of, um, of that time, and it was like, like, like Liverpool was. It was, I don't know, it was a... It was a working street, so there was always the pictures you see. There was always trucks unloading produce into the warehouses. The only, I mean, now if, you, if you're down here, the uh, Matthew Street now, it's it's full of bars, restaurants, very vibrant. But back in the day, the Cavern was here um, at number ten Matthew Street, and of course the Cavern didn't have a drinks license, so the Beatles and the other acts in between, uh, you know, they weren't. Bob Waller apparently didn't approve of this. But they all used to sneak off down to the pub. There's just a pub a few yards down there called The Grapes, which is still there today. So, but if you go back to, you know, 61, early 60s, 63, that was really the only place to get a drink on Matthew Street. And I think the, the, the vision for, for Matthew Street is, is to be, you know, like be, you go to Beale Street in Memphis and Broadway and Nashville, and there's, there's live music ringing out of every bar from like 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, we're, we're, we're getting there, really. I mean, we start our music at 11 o'clock. A lot of the other bars 
you'll hear live music ringing out. And it's, it's a very vibrant place. Um, I'm, I'm still producing music as well, you know, which, which is important. It's, uh, it's, never got, it's always been a music, a music street. So from where we're standing now in front of the current entrance, where was the original doorway? The original doorway is just, it's about, uh, I'd say about 20 yards further down. The irony is when it opened in 57, that was the front door. And if you remember the cavern closed for a while uh, in early 1966, the owner went bankrupt, uh, Roy Mc, Ray McFall. And the new owners, they, they improved the club because it needed you know, the drainage, the famous toilets and the whole drainage system. And the, the, the footprint changed slightly they extended the cavern. And where we are today, where you go in the cavern today, that is the entrance that you used to go in from 66. So in, in, when it reopened, they changed the doorway to where we are now. What I think is important, the, it's always been on the same address. Because you know, you know what it's like about myths of, like, oh, it was on the other side of the road, it wasn't. Um, it was here on this site from 1957 to 73. And it did move over the road to where it became Eric's eventually, just, just over, about 10 yards from where we are. Um, and it only lasted 18 months. But of course, they kept the original cavern sign up there, um, even though it's trading as, as Eric's. That, that stayed up there till the early 90s. So I think a, a lot of the locals, they got it into their own heads. Oh, that's, that's where the cavern was. It was on that side. But it only been for 18 months. So when they reopened it and rebuilt it in the early 80s, the, the doorway was the, the same doorway from 66. The irony, of course, our fire escape is exactly where the original door was from 1957, which doesn't do us any favours at all when you're trying to explain, no, the cavern didn't move. Well, it did move, but it was rebuilt on the same site. So the footprint you see today when you go in there, it occupies about 70% of the original footprint of the club. And as I say, it's like, it's like any, any business, I suppose. It, 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 it kept expanding through those years anyway. When the cavern reopened in July uh, 1966, Harold Wilson actually did the official opening ceremony. So this is, and it's great footage, we've just used it in our documentary, of, of Harold Wilson arriving with Bessie Braddock, uh, Liverpool MP, and Ken Dodd. And they, this, so this is the entrance you see them going to in 1966. So if it's good enough for Ken Dodd, it's good enough for us. You've been with the cabin ten years, John. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. In in the current position, yeah, I joined uh, joined about ten years ago. But my association with the club goes back quite a bit further than that. I actually actually played the cavern for the first time. I'm a musician as well. I played the cavern in 1987. That was the first time my association began with the club. But I've also known the the owners since um, 89, 90, and they well they took over the club in 91. So I've sort of, you know, I've been involved with the story since the early 90s, really. And what were you playing at the cavern? Back in 87. Yeah. Oh, well, I was actually um, connected with the Beatles, of course, but it was actually, I was, it, I, I was an actor musician. And just before I went to drama college, I did a local musical called, um, I've got to remember, The Need for Heroes. And it was a musical about Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Of course, Ringo being uh, in, in the Hurricanes with Rory. And I played the bass player. And we did a, we did like a press launch where we just, we invited all the press down and, and the the cast, including Danny McCall, who went on to be on Brookside for many years. We did it. We did a thirty minute Rory Storm and the Hurricanes set on the front stage. And the cavern was very different back then to how it is now. It it was yeah. I mean it reopened in eighty four. So in eighty seven when I played it, I was twenty, I think twenty one. I was aware of the cavern, but I remember going into the cavern in 87 and I, mean, I was a Beatle fan, you know, obviously uh, a big John Lennon fan, but I remember being totally underwhelmed, which is an awful thing to say now, yeah. but it was, it, it opened in 84 and it just seemed, and I suppose when you're that age as well and you, you know, I, I didn't go to the original cavern, so I didn't have that opinion of it and it just looked a little bit naff. Now in in my role as a director of the cabin and being immersed in it, also we're, we're not far. We've just come out of the, of the back of our 60th anniversary, so you, I, I now know a lot more about the whole picture of of the cavern and the whole story, uh, which you'd hope, wouldn't you, as a director? But when it reopened in '84, the the new owners, they, their vision of the cavern, they were aiming at it like original cave dwellers, 
uh, who they th- they thought well they're going to be in their mid thirties now. They maybe they want something a bit more sophisticated. There was carpet on the floor for the stars, <laughs> which isn't very rock and it's roll. Hard to imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Very sticky, probably. Yeah, and 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 it was all all nice lighting and and I remember the back of the cavern, which is now the Cavern Live Lounge, um, which is you know our second stage. That was they'd almost recreated the Liverpool street scene, and it was it was all a little bit. It just didn't. It didn't seem. It certainly didn't seem like a credible music venue, which 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 it is today. I'm I'm glad to say. So back then, would people have been? Would tourists have been visiting? Yeah, I mean, the whole reason um, the cavern was reopened in '84 was because it was it was a reaction to the assassination of of, of John Lennon in 1980. Prior to that, there had been. There, there was, certainly wasn't a Beatle industry, and there was no real Beatle tourism. But as a result of us losing John, more and more people did start coming to Liverpool mm-hmm. to pay tribute to John, pay tribute to the Beatles. So by the time the cavern opened in '84, yes, there was tourists around, but certainly nowhere near. You know, you go down there today, and it's you know, but Liverpool's a different place than it was in '84. You know, yeah. we've come on so much. But, yeah, there were, there were tourists, but it was also very much aimed at, you know, a local, maybe sl- slightly older clientele. They did live music, but I think it was a bit more cabaret. And it, it, it failed originally. It just did, it didn't seem to, uh, to take off. So if you were a tourist come to pay it, sort of pay tribute to John Lennon on a pilgrimage, if you like, you wouldn't have experienced what it had been like back in the day at all? No, no, I, I don't think so, no. I mean, it was, it was a bit sanitised. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's probably easy for us now in 2018, in hindsight, to, to, you know, I think what we do down there now and have done as a company since we took over it in the early 90s, you know, hopefully we've got it right. They were reopening an iconic venue 11 years after it had closed, and maybe they just didn't, maybe... Maybe the timing was wrong. I don't know. It just they it didn't. It, it failed twice actually as as, as a venue. Mm-hmm. I think it failed to attract the right audience, and then it eventually it became. Um, they went after the student market, the newly emerging student market, and the live music element of it went went off off the boil. It was more DJs, mm-hmm. which you know, which you look you look at it. And I'm thinking it's the Caffin Club. You know, it's all about live music, but it lost its way, and. In 90, we, we as a company, we took over it in ninety one, and that was our main aim was to was to restore it to what it had been, which is a live music venue, as well as a, a tourist destination, and and get that try and get that balance right. Really, so you don't you don't see it as a museum of the time when the Beatles were playing there. It's very much still a relevant music venue in Liverpool today. Absolutely, I I, I always say if people say you know what's what's the cavern like, or you know what. The Cavern today is absolutely a major tourist destination in Liverpool, without a doubt. But the the the, the, the challenge for, for us as owners of the Cavern Club is, you know, yes, it's a major tourist destination, but it's still very much a thriving, relevant live music venue. Mm. Um, it would be, you know, it would be easy for it just to be a, a, a museum where you, you go in and you can you look at all the pictures of the, the Beatles. It's not just about the Beatles. That's that's the point. Undoubtedly, you know, without the Beatles, would there be a cavern? No, there wouldn't be. Mm-hmm. There'd be no interest in the cavern whatsoever. But the, the, the Beatles were there for such a, a short period, and I put the club on the map, and absolutely we celebrate the Beatles in there. You know, people come from all over the world, on a pilgrimage, it is. A, it re- really is a pilgrimage um, to the cavern to celebrate the Beatles. But we also celebrate all the other artists that have played. You know, the the list of of, of artists, musicians that have played the cavern since it opened. Not you know, it, the cavern didn't start when the, the Beatles went on the stage for the first time. You know, it opened in 1957 mm. as a jazz venue, and you know. Right, right back there in in fifty seven, it was attracting the big names of the jazz scene, mm-hmm. you know. And throughout throughout that period, the jazz, the skiffle, the rock and roll, the big American blues artists, the soul, the northern soul, Motown, um, and, and where we are today, which is you know, it's every genre of music. And so we celebrate, you know, over sixty one years of the Cavern's musical history, and also in, encourage and actively promote. The artists of today, 
mm-hmm. in, not you know in Liverpool and the the artists of tomorrow you know that's which is important. You can roll out these things and they, they all sound can sound a bit cheesy you know it's the past the present and the future but it, it, with the cavern it, it has to be. Mm-hmm. We celebrate the past. We're in the present. This is now. And we're always looking forward to the future, whether it be, you know, um, you know, being involved with new music projects, with schools projects, uh, universities, promoting new music, encouraging new artists. And that keeps the, the, it keeps the cavern relevant. And I think that's that's the, the again, one of the other challenges. It's got to be the cavern's always been relevant and it's always um, been of its time. Mm-hmm. You know, when the Beatles left in 63, you know, it didn't pause. You know, the scene moved forward and it changed with the times. You know, in the, the late 60s, early 70s, you know, the, it was a rock venue, it, you know, which was reflecting what was happening. It's always reflected what was going on in music and, uh, and, and does so today. Yeah, well, this is the the Cavern Wall of Fame. We unveiled this in 1997 on the 40th anniversary of the Cavern. And basically, when it, when, it, when, it, when we re- unveiled it in 97, it features on every brick on this wall, features every artist who played the Cavern from the, the original Cavern Club from 1957 to 1973. So whether it be, you know, of course, the Beatles and, you know, I'm looking at the wall now, Elton John, Moody Blues, Eric Clapton, Jack Bruce, Stevie Wonder, Status Quo, all of those big artists who played during that period are there. But importantly, what you also have got in here are all those other bands that maybe, you know, the, the local Mersey Beat band, the local Northwest bands who didn't make it but had followers here. And it didn't matter, you know, if, if on, the, on this wall you might have played The Cavern twice in, I don't know, 1964 and never played again. But from the original diaries, that's where we got the information from. So you played the cavern in that period, you, your band is on that wall. What we've done over the last few years, again, because we keep moving forward, you know, whenever we get any artist of, of note in recent years, we've, we've also, we keep adding to this wall of fame. So you'll see other artists, I'm looking there, of course, Oasis, uh, they actually played in 1992, but other bands like Adele, is now on the wall because she played in 2011. Uh, Jesse J, Joe Bonamassa, we added Joe Bonamassa in t- 2016. So we keep adding to this this wall of fame, and it really is. I mean, it's incredible. We, we, we're running out of space, if, if I'm being honest with you. We, you know, we, we do need to extend the wall, but it's here, and it's it's a massive uh, tourist attraction. It's um, and this is as you come onto Matthew Street. It's the first thing you see, of course, is is the uh, statue of John Lennon, which I have to say possibly is still the most photographed statue, I think, in Liverpool. Since we unveil the, the statues of the Beatles on the walls of Fondé, you know, they've been so successful. But sh- purely because of the, 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 the sheer number of people here, it's, you know, your first thing to do when you come to Matthew Street, you get your photo with John Lennon. And then it's the Wall of Fame, uh, which is actually the, the front of our, the Cavern Pub, because we opened the Cavern Pub about 23 years ago. Uh, and again, it's an extension of the club, really. And it, there's a lot of memorabilia inside the Cavern Pub, uh, a lot of the history of the club, uh, a lot of sign stuff. The John Lennon statue looks very relaxed. He's got his, his legs folded and his hands in his pockets, his collars up. He looks almost like he's just leaning there, watching the world go by. The statue of John is actually based on the, um, the cover of John's rock and roll album, 1974. And that was a photo uh, which was taken of him when he was in Hamburg. And I think 1961. So that's that. That was the the inspiration for that, which is just it is literally John leaning. Well, the original he's, he's leaning on a doorway in Hamburg, and it's really it's when they were going through the Gene Vincent period, and they just you know you might notice he's got a slightly different haircut because back in on that original photo, uh, they did they, you know they were still sporting the the, the rock and roll quiffs all swept back, greased back. Uh, we did that head originally. But we've, it's actually the third head that John's had in there, I have to say. And that's probably a more recognisable uh, image of, of John. But the influence is, is right back to Hamburg, you know, and Hamburg and Liverpool hand in hand is, is obviously, that's where they learned how, how to be the Beatles. And on the wall, you've got the Beatles right in the middle and then just first names only, Paul to the left, John on the right, and then Ringo and George underneath. And then underneath that, you've got Stu and Pete as well. Yeah, of course, because uh, Stu Sutcliffe, uh, Stuart Sutcliffe, the you know, 
a bass player with the Beatles. We were talking about Hamburg, you know, Stu was, was with them uh, in the early days in Hamburg and stayed in Hamburg uh, with Astrid and we tragically lost Stu uh, right back it. And of course, next to that is Pete Best, you know, because you can't talk about the Beatles w without mentioning Pete Best because he, the Beatles played there 292 times and I would say the majority of those shows were when Pete was with the band. So of course, of course, Pete Best is on there, Stu Sutcliffe, because that, that massive part of the story, you know, the Quarrymen are on there, because again, the Quarrymen, John's first band, they played the Cavern in uh, 1957, when it, when it had, you know, it was it had opened as a jazz club, but interestingly enough, they did allow a few skiffle groups to come in, which was, you know, the the sign of precursor, if you like, of what was to come with the rock and roll. So the Quarrymen are on there. They played in '57. There's a lot on this wall. You see a lot of the uh, the big jazz names of the time, uh, the big blues artists, the American blues artists. So it's quite, as the Cavern is, it's quite eclectic. Uh, Brian Epstein is also. It's actually the anniversary of when Brian came, first came down to the Cavern. But on the day we're recording this, which is the 9th of November, uh, 9th of November 1961 is the day that Brian made that famous walk down Matthew Street from Nems and came down to the cavern to, uh, to see the Beatles. And Brian's on there, you know, you could say, well, Brian didn't perform in the club, but without Brian Epstein, you know, the Beatles arguably would not have become what they were. And a huge part of the Beatles story and a part of the cavern story. But yeah, I'd, I'd like to think we, we, we celebrate everybody, everybody on that wall, really, who's played a part. And from the door of the cabin, we can also see the new, well, relatively new, Silla Black statue by Emma Rogers. It was unveiled a few years ago. Yeah, it was, yeah. We unveiled that on the, on the cabin's 60th anniversary, so 16th of January 2017. The statue's wonderful. I mean, so sad to, leave, to lose Silla. You know, it was very sudden for everyone. And because, I mean, I think Silla's whole career was overtaken, shall we say, by her a TV success. Well, she was huge, you know, Saturday night primetime TV. But of course she started as a singer and she was a fantastic singer. And she famously started out as the cloakroom girl in the Cavern Club and would get up and guest with the bands. And she was very much part of that scene. When, when Scylla passed away, uh, it was remarkable really. Pe the people descended on, on the Cavern Club and Matthew Street to pay tribute to, to Scylla. So this, the whole of this, where we are now, was just a, a, a mass of flowers and uh, tributes to Scylla, which I know that provided the family with a, a lot of comfort that they took from the fact that they were seeing all these scenes from Matthew Street. So when it came to the idea that the uh, sons had to, to donate a statue and commission the statue, and Emma did a fantastic job, they wanted it to be somewhere meaningful. Um, that outpouring of grief and, and, and tribute that was attached to the Cavern Club when Scylla passed away, that, they, they said it has to be on Matthew Street. So it, we unveiled it uh, alongside the family. Um, and the, again, the street was packed with people paying tributes. And it's quite nice, it's right in front of our fire exit, not in the way of any regulations, I have to say, but it's, it's, it's right where the original doorway was in 1957 to 66. So when Scylla was here, you know, as, as a customer, as a, a punter coming to see the bands, and then when she worked here, that's the doorway she would have worked in, uh, would, have, would have walked into it. And it's a classic pose of Scylla with her hands outstretched, which is a, you know, a, a, a really welcoming image of Scylla. And I know the family were delighted with it. And uh, I spoke to Robert, one, one of her sons, maybe about six months ago, and we were still talking about, you know, the, the impact of the statue. And it's, it's another great addition to the street. And so the journey starts here, really, and then we, we make our way over to the club. So here we are, uh, number 10, Matthew Street. We are entering into the Cavern Club. Uh, what's interesting, just as we're walking down here, when the Cavern opened in 57, the original poster, which was, uh, which was designed by Tony Booth, graphic artist, um, on the bottom of it, it said, um, the Cavern Club, 10 Matthew Street, L2 in the basement. When we did our 60th anniversary uh, just under two years ago, uh, Tony, who's sadly passed away since, since then, lovely guy, we, we commissioned Tony because he was still producing his artwork. We, produced him, we asked him if he would produce our 60th anniversary poster. Um, and on the bottom of it, I said, if, if you could just repeat what you put 
on the on 1957 because that statement, um, and I love this, uh, the statement, the Cavern Club, 10 Matthew Street, L2 in the basement, is still exactly the same today. <laughs> so that's where we're going. 10 Matthew Street, L2 in the basement. Now, the Cavern Club today is one level lower, it's one level deeper, if you like, than the original Cavern Club. And then the original Cavern had 19 steps down. We now have 33. Uh, we do have a lift at the back. Um, but yeah, so we're going down now. So it's, it's the, the reason it was, it was built one level deeper was to do with when, when they were building Cavern Walks and the underground car park, it was purely a practical um, measure for what was what was they were building above. Yeah. The notable change when you walk in, you come into the club now, which we are doing right now, and we're going to turn we're going to turn left as we go in, and we see the famous famous stage. When the cavern was operating up till 1973, and we came, remember I was saying we came in through the original door, and then where, where we were, the cavern used to run a different way, so. The cavern now, today, you, you come down the stairs, turn left, and there's the famous stage. In the original club up until 1973, you came down the stairs, and the, and the stage was right ahead of you. Especially for the ladies all the way from Grimsby, Lincolnshire. Nowhere near County Mayo. Not nowhere near St Albans. You've been to County Mayo. Do you know that lady in the back? She's from County Mayo. She's taking her clothes off. You might recognise her. And of course, recently you had McCartney himself in there. Yeah, we did. Yeah, Paul first came back in December '99, which was a that was a major turning point for the Cavern Club. It was almost like the seal of approval, you know, again, you know, as Paul back at the cavern. Yeah. And the reaction and the, the, the press and the attention of that was, was unbelievable. I never thought, I was there as, a, as a, I was invited to that, that gig, so I was there in 99 cause I, before I was actually working for the company. I didn't think he'd come back. But, yeah, he came back on the 26th of July. We'd, we were sitting on the dates for about three months. Yeah. Uh, we'd been asked to re, um, pencil in a few dates. So we were sworn to secrecy. So how did you keep that secret? Well, you've got you've got, you've got to. It's just you know there was a, there was a few of us in the office we were who had to be involved. Mm. There was uh, myself and and Bill mainly were dealing with it. Uh, Bill Heckle, one of the owners. But there's a few other key members of staff who who needed to know, and it was it wasn't quite you know if you speak you lose your job, but it wasn't wasn't <laughs> far off you know. Yet we just kept it we kept it quiet and it probably got confirmed at about seven weeks to go. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's like anything. You, you see the end results, like people see that, you know, p uh, footage or a picture of Paul at the cavern. You think, oh, that's amazing, the work that goes into these things. Yeah, I can imagine. Because, you know, he's, he's the biggest music star in, in the world, full stop. And as, as, as relaxed as he is, and he's, he's, he, I think he's in a great place at the moment, Paul. He seems so at ease with himself mm. uh, and wanted to, wants to get back to his roots, you know. And he's always back in Liverpool. He does a lot in Liverpool. But the work that goes into that, um, and you've got to get it right. Yeah. You, you know, it's working with with Paul's producers on on, on the, this show. You know, they obviously used to doing these arenas or these on tour constantly, and it's they themselves said it's harder to do something like the Cavern, or he played Lipper the day before, or Abbey Road Studios on the Monday, as part of this this whole week of events. It's harder for them to to set something like that up because. These things aren't meant to happen in the Cavern Club, no. you know, for 300 people. So um, it was it was incredible. Uh, a lot of hard work went into it. We welcomed him there. He, he, he was on great form. The sound check, he, legendary, he always does long sound checks. He did about an hour of yeah. sound checks, including songs that weren't in the show. Oh, wow. S songs that you, we're, we're all looking at each other thinking, oh, my God, I can't believe he's doing that. I think he was just enjoying the moment. Absolutely. Well, he, the gig itself, uh, he, he ended up doing two hours, five minutes, mm. which we've been told um, by his people uh, that he'd probably do about an hour and a half. We were thinking, that's fantastic. But he ended up doing two hours, five minutes, which was five songs short of his usual arena tour. Yeah. We spoke to one of the, one of the, uh, the guys in the band afterwards. And he was saying, oh, it's increasing. He said he just kept on going. He said there was a list 
and it, so he was obviously enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, but the set list was fantastic. It, it it covered. It was like a dream McCartney gig. You know, it covered the early days of right back to the Quarrymen, mm. uh, right back to you know Twenty Flight Rock, where you know the song that got him into the Beatles. The the, the Beatle output was fantastic. It was early stuff, mid stuff, late stuff, wings solo stuff. Obviously, he was previewing his new album as well. I think he did three or four off um, Egypt Station. So the set list was just, it was all out. It was fantastic. Two hours, five minutes. The man's a genius. I've, I've said this before when I've, I've seen him at arenas and he does like two and a half hours. He doesn't have a sip of water mm. in the whole of the show. He's not, you know, it's a, it's a big set and those songs of, of Paul's, they're right up there and as a vocalist. Yeah. And not one sip of water. He's just as cool as anything and just does this show. And as I say, he was so at, at, at ease with it. Uh, but it's been filmed. It, it, there was a full film production was was on it, and it's going to be shown in Cannes next April, and then it's going to be out for everyone to see. That's really we, exciting. It is, and it's it's you know it's obviously great for not only not only for the cabin, but it's great for Liverpool because yeah. every time something like that happens, you know, all eyes are back on on the city again, and it, it was yeah, that was it was it was a special day. He seemed quite emotional when he talked about it afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I think. You know, it's it's seventy six now, isn't he? And I think nostalgia and and going back to where it, I think when he came back in ninety nine, it was a big deal. Mm. But it was it felt more that was a a, a a launch for his rock and roll album, which in itself was nostalgic because it was him, you know, releasing this rock and roll run, devil run, paying tribute to all of you know the the, the artists that inspired him as as a. Before the Beatles, all the rock and roll, the Buddy Ollies and the uh, Elvis, and uh, this felt like I, I think this was. I, I think he probably knows he won't be coming back to Cavern again. Do you think? But well, I mean, never say never. I mean, I would. I didn't think he'd come back this time, but I think it was part of that because he'd been with all the you know the carpool um, karaoke he did with James Corden. Yeah, and we went back to the house, which he'd said. He'd, he'd been invited to go back to his house, which is now the National Trust property, in the past, but he'd never wanted to really go there. Mm. And he, he he did. He went there. And, and it must be very strange going back to your childhood home. Yeah, and and in and it's all done in a way that it would have been, but it's not quite your childhood home. But it's all you can't get yeah. you can't you can't get your head around that, can you? But can you get your head around being McCartney in the first place? No, and so young. I mean, he's always he's almost always been famous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I think he, he, he the, you know, do, doing that that trip back to Liverpool, going to Abbey Road, uh, always does stuff at Lipper. But I think that he's at a, a, a point in his life where I think he's totally at ease with with who he is, what he's doing, and he's and that 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 shows. And I, I think he did say, you know, coming back to the cavern, it's this, you know, this is where it all began and. Mm. A special gig, apparently, um, a week before it was it was going to be filmed, but it wasn't. It was just going to be captured, you know. And about a week before, from Paul himself, he he said, "No, actually, I want to get it filmed properly," okay. because you know I, I was dealing with the film company for about five six days leading up to it, and they'd only got the call on the Friday. Oh wow! And the gig was the Thursday. That's quite a job to get at the last minute. It, it, it is when when the the scale of it. I mean, the director is. Um, He's, he's, I think he's filmed Paul before. He did um, an iconic film with the Rolling Stones in um, in Cuba, I think it was. And he's won all sorts of awards as a, as a, as a filmmaker. Mm. So it's, it was top level and, and it looks incredible. And that was all thrown together in a week because wow. Paul said, no. I and I think that's, that's him saying, actually, you know, this is special. This is me doing a proper Paul McCartney show at the Cavern. Um, and he wanted it capturing, and we can't wait to see it. You know, it's going to look great. It's as I say, it just reflects back to to Paul, the Beatles, Liverpool. You know, that that and the cavern, that connection, um, which is a worldwide connection. Yeah, and it's great that I mean, there were people even queuing outside who didn't get to come in, but obviously there are people all around the world who would have liked to have been there. So it's great they're going to get to experience it. Yeah, absolutely. Because you know, like if you're doing what you know what was um, a secret gig. People were saying, "Well, you know, we had no chance of getting it because we were abroad." Well, that's it's a secret gig, but <laughs> the yeah, nature of it. yeah. But but the fact, as you say, it's, it's been captured and captured properly, and there's been a few little snippets let out, and it's it's. I, th I think it's uh, 
it's 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 gonna be it's gonna be wonderful. So we've now walked into the Cavern Live Lounge and we're stood underneath where the original stage would have been. That's right, yeah. The irony is, uh, when I was saying about when the cavern reopened in 1984, it was built on a slightly different configuration. And the original arches ran this way where we are. Where we're standing right now, albeit, if you remember, we're one level lower. So we're one level deeper than the, the original. Above us here, in this position, is where the original stage was. And the irony is, and, and it's, quite, it's quite ironic, when Paul McCartney came back here for the first time in 1999, um, he was actually well, 10 yards away from where, the, where he would have been for those 292 gigs. Uh, and again, when he came back in 2018. And the reason he played this stage was purely because it's a bigger stage. It's, it's, you know, it's easier for us to put the bigger artists on this stage, but it is closer to, to where he had been all those years ago. And you're still getting the same atmosphere that you would have got then? Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, this, this room itself is... Um, it's the Cavern Live Lounge, and it's, it's, it's quite an eclectic... I mean, the venue's eclectic, I keep saying that, in terms of what we do here. But this room is very eclectic. We, you know, this is the room where usually any uh, big artists who want to play the Cavern... And they, it's, it's usually because they want to play the Cavern. You know, it's a, even for, like, established artists, it's like a, a bucket list gig. So this... Adele played in this room um, in 2011. She did uh, two previews of, of 21 and one of them was in the cavern to 150 people. Uh, the atmosphere on, on that night was just incredible. I mean, you know, to see... I mean, no-one knew those songs. Um, there was a preview, but you knew you were listening to something special. Three weeks later, 21 was out, and she's conquered the world. But, you know, other artists that have played in this uh, early, early days, Oasis, Travis, Jesse J, played on this stage. Joe Bonamassa, the uh, fantastic American blues artist, he... You know, these are the phone calls you love. You get a phone call from an agent it's about two years ago saying, um, would, would we mind hosting a fan club-only gig uh, for Joe Bonamassa to launch his arena tour? It's like, oh, yeah, OK, we don't mind. We, we can accommodate that. Um, you have people phoning you. You're not ringing these people up. No, it's, it's you know, in an ideal world, you know, you, you could ring up someone and say, you know, do you, do you, will you play the cavern? It, it, it usually comes from the artist. And it's usually, you know, I, I, was, I was with a, 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 a Liverpool band this morning, uh, who I won't name because it was a private conversation, but um, a well-known Liverpool band from the 80s. Um, and I was talking to them. They were doing a photo session here, but they've never played here. And I said, you know, I'd love to get you on here. It'd be great, but it's got to fit. So there, you know, perfect example. I had a conversation this morning. They said, well... We're going to go away and think of something that will work, whether it be a fan club or a, a record launch or a, a Q&A with some live music. So it, it usually happens from that, really. Um, you know, we, it's... A lot of the time, we, we, we've had many conversations with artists in the past uh, at various uh, music industry do's, if you like, where you can have a, a proper chat. And all of, everybody wants to play here, but sometimes you've got to get... It's when the management get involved then it becomes complicated. But the, the, but the best times are when, you know, like, like literally Bo Diddley, you know, Bo Diddley played the cabin. Wow. And he rang the office himself. Uh, it was Bill Heckel answered the phone and... Uh, <laughs> he said, cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Bill thought it was a joke, but he would, you know, ah, this is Bo, you know. Um, I want to play the cabin, man. Um, you know, we, but, it's, but it's not only artists who are playing here, you know, it's, it's, you, never, you never know who's going to come in. And we, we'll get phone calls. My, my favourite one, which was nearly 10 years ago, so I was just looking at the picture. Henry Winkler, the Fonz, my childhood hero. I was sitting in the office, uh, where our office is just around the corner from the club, and I got a call saying, oh, Henry Winkler, the Fonz has just walked into the cabin pub, so I've told him he needs to go over to the club. And before the, the, the conversation was even finished, I'd grabbed my coat, which just happened to be a leather jacket, black leather, it was fate. I chucked me black leather jacket, ran down here, and there's the Fonz in the cavern. So this is when he was, he was here in Liverpool doing Panto. That's right, yeah, ten years ago he was doing Panto. Um, and he was a big Beatle fan. Turns out he'd met all of them, I think, except for George. Um, there's a famous photo of, of John Lennon and, and Julian on the set of Happy Days, 
in the early 70s. Um, but he was a huge Beatles fan. He was, as you say, doing panto in Liverpool and wanted to come down the cabin. So I, I, and I was, you know, he was my hero when I was a kid. Uh, and I don't get starstruck. You know, you don't in this job because you, you, you do meet a lot of people and, you know, everybody's normal. But it was the Fonz. I, I was quite excited. Uh, but he, 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 he became quite a friend of ours, really. He used to uh, pop into the pub and see the staff, and he was a lovely guy. But you you never know who's going to walk in here. You know, you never know what phone calls you're going to get from artists who, you know, want to play here. And and that's, you know, it keeps it keeps things alongside the new artists. I think, you know, the, the new music is, is, I always say this, but it's it's integral to what we do. It, st it stops us being a museum. You know, we're not just in the past. The new artists are, are incredibly important. But also, when you get a big name coming in, um, it keeps, I always say, it keeps the, t the back of the T-shirt moving forward because we have the names on the back. But these big artists, they, you know, they, they just, they just want to play the cavern. Stephen Van Zandt, uh, Little Stephen, Bruce Springsteen's guitarist. Um, we got a phone call like 12 months ago, literally 12 months ago. Um, he wanted, he was doing a gig in Liverpool, could he play the cavern? And I said, like, yeah, absolutely, we'll make that work. Huge Beatle fan, huge friend of uh, Paul McCartney. The only problem was um, he was touring with a 15-piece band, <laughs> including the full brass section, back and vocals, two keyboards, 15 people. So I was speaking to the agent and I said, well, if, if he can strip it back to, because he wanted to play the front stage, he wanted to do a lunchtime session, and it had to be the front stage because he wanted to replicate the Beatles. Huge Beatles fan, which is brilliant. So you're doing everything you can to accommodate this request because you're thinking, yeah, of course we want, you know, Stephen Van Zandt in the cabin. And I said, if you can strip it back to a six-piece rock and roll set, you know, we can just about squeeze them on. He said, no, he'll only do it. He, he wants to do it with the full band, which was so, and we did it. We, we, we extended the stage to the side, which you don't think certainly never been done since we've had the cavern. I don't think it's ever been done. We double the size of the, of the cavern, uh, of the front stage, and 15-piece uh, band, again, because we wanted him to play. And did he tell you what it would have been like, what it would have been like for him to have experienced playing here? Yeah, yeah we, 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 we did an interview with him for our documentary, and he was, he was talking about, you know, the, the, the huge influence on, on American, young, young American. He, he, when, the, when the Beatles first went over there in 64, you know, he was a, a teen, and that he, that he, he said it changed, it changed his, his life. The Beatles changed his life. So for him, coming back, he actually came back about a month ago, um, or maybe two months ago, he was back in Liverpool, and he called in with his wife just to, uh, just to have a look around and have a, have, a, have a drink. And, you know, I think it's just coming to the Cavern Club. It's, you know, it sounds cliche and hot. You know, like a, 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 but it is the mecca for, for Beatles fans certainly and for music fans. It's 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 it's, a, it's mecca. It's the place, yeah. which 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 really is, you know, I can you know you can just say that and go. It's it's the mecca. It's a big responsibility from our point of view. You know, it, it, we, when we that's never lost on us uh, as directors, as managers, as people uh, who are, you know, looking after the cavern because the cavern's going to be here. Well, after you know, this is you know Stratford, Shakespeare, you know the Beatles, Liverpool, Cavern's here forever. It's a responsibility to make sure we look after it. So you consider yourself custodians then? Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, we one. I think Bill came out with this once, and I did repeat it. And it's a bit cheesy, but you know, it's like we're just holding the baby. It really is like a custodian because it will be here. The Cavern, the, the Cavern Club will be here, you know, for, forevermore. Um, and it's, and I, I'll say this with 100% confidence, it's, it's, we've had the cavern longer than any other previous company, previous ownership, and it's in very safe hands. Um, but it, and it, it is a responsibility, and you see that every day when people come in and it's maybe their first time, and it is this place of pilgrimage, and you see them walk in and you see them turn and, and see that iconic stage that... You know, it, you, there's the famous footage of the only footage of the Beatles in the cavern, which is the 1962, um, the black and white footage of them doing some other guy. And you walk in, and for a Beatle fan who's just come from, you know, from Brazil or Australia, or it's it's it is this pilgrimage. You see it on their faces, and you, and and we have to, again, very very cheesy what I'm going to say, but I, I I mean it. We we the responsibility we have to fulfil people's expectations. 
because they might only be here for half an hour. You know, hopefully they've, they've got longer or half a day, a day, one night. It doesn't matter. We, you, you've got to try and make sure that for that, however long they're here, they, they get the flavour of what it is and they celebrate the past, the future, and they're actually in, in a, a, a real music venue. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hugely important.